Hey everybody, in this video, as you can see, I am going to discuss euploidy and aneuploidy. So, okay, what are these things? Essentially, so a euploid individual is an individual with whole sets of chromosomes. So every, every uh, set of chromosomes the individual has will be complete. It won't be missing any copies of any of the chromosomes in that set. So whether an individual has one set of chromosomes, like for a haploid organism, or two sets for a diploid or organism, and uh, so on and so forth, three sets, four sets, five sets, every set is complete. And that individual, we say, is euploid. So an aneuploid individual an aneuploid individual is missing one or more chromosomes from a set, or, or alter, alternately has an extra one or more chromosome of a set. So aneuploidy can arise from errors during meiosis. So Errors during meiosis are major causes of aneuploidy. So we have this fancy term here called non-disjunction. So essentially what this means is failure to separate. So the chromosomes fail to separate during meiosis uh, uh, at various stages. So we can have non-disjunction occurring during meiosis one. So that's what this is, meiosis one right here. And this is where the homologs, so remember the homologous chromosomes pair during meiosis. In meiosis one, the homologs are paired. If they fail to separate and both homologs move to one pole together, well, that would be an example of non-disjunction. So a non-disjunction of, of one pair of homologs during meiosis would lead to gametes that have, well, it will lead to two gametes that have one extra chromosome or gametes that have one, uh, are missing one chromosome. So two gametes that have one extra chromosome and two gametes that are missing a chromosome. And this N, what is this N? That's the haploid number. So if we're talking about a diploid organism, 2N, so that's how many chromosomes the diploid organism normally has, the gametes, if non-disjunction occurs during meiosis one, the gametes are gonna have this many chromosomes, N plus one, or N minus one. So non-disjunction can also occur during meiosis two. So given this example here, we're talking about uh, non-disjunction occurring when it occurs during meiosis two, it, it occurs to the dyads or with respect to the dyads. So if non-disjunction should occur in a single dyad uh, during meiosis two, assuming meiosis one worked out fine, non-disjunction during meiosis two for a single dyad would lead to two gametes that are normal. So N gametes, these are, these are perfectly balanced gametes. They have one haploid set of chromosomes and two aneuploid gametes, one with an extra chromosome and one that is missing a chromosome. So let's specifically look at how these two processes work. So I have this diagram for you because I don't know if that was clear. There's a lot of fancy jargony words in there. So here's an example of non-disjunction during meiosis one. Now the diagram here just has uh, two pairs of homologous chromosomes. And okay, normally we would expect, right? one homolog from each homologous pair to go to each pole. So let's say non-disjunction occurs with respect to the blue chromosomes there. So that means both of these chromosomes are going to move to the same pole and none are going to, going to go to the opposite pole. So that's what we have here. So we have both of those homologs went to one pole. And now this is the cell that needs to go through meiosis two. And look at this one over here. This one has no blue chromosomes. This has two blue chromosomes. 
So we have major problems with both of the products of meiosis one, with both of the products that now have to go undergo meiosis two. So how would these align on the metaphase plate? Well, they would align normally. There's no pairing of homologs during meiosis two, right? And assuming all of those centromeres split, we would get two meiotic products that look like this down here. Each of these has an extra chromosome. And we can see by the color coding here that they each have an extra blue chromosome. So these are unbalanced gametes. Now how about this one up here? This one had no blue chromosome. So when that undergoes meiosis two, it's going to make two gametes. This one right here and this one, these are identical, right? So they're both missing a blue chromosome. So we can designate these, the number of chromosomes, total number of chromosomes as N minus one. And we can see from the diagram, they're both missing the blue chromosome. So again, unbalanced gametes. If any of these gametes were used for fertilization, we would expect it's very likely that the zygote would be uh, inviable. Um, I should qualify that again, you know, it depends on the organism and it depends on what chromosomes we're talking about. We're going to see more about the, the uh, how it, we're going to see some human examples in a moment or I'm going to discuss some human examples in a moment. It's been a long day. If you're watching these videos, you can probably see uh, my clock on the down uh, lower right corner. <laughs> so uh, please forgive me if I'm uh, uh, not making any sense right now. Okay, so now we have non-disjunction. Non-disjunction can occur also during meiosis two. And here, instead of non-disjunction occurring between the homologous pairs of chromosomes, it occurs between uh, a dyad. So here, meiosis one, we're going to say everything works out normally there. Let me zoom out here, this might be better. So meiosis one works normally. One chromosome from each pair of homologs moves to each pole. OK, now we have these products of meiosis one have to undergo meiosis two. Now let's say this blue one right here fails to separate during meiosis. So that would be, that's the one that's uh, um, not disjoining. That's the one that does not separate. As a result, if both move to the left here, well, this product is going to have an extra chromosome, a blue chromosome again, so N plus one. This one over here doesn't get its copy of the blue chromosome, so it's N minus one. Now, because non-disjunction occurred during meiosis two, it only happened over here. Well, there's no reason to suspect that this one would also undergo non-disjunction. So it forms two normal gametes. Each gamete is balanced. Each gamete has a single copy of the purple chromosome and a single copy of the blue chromosome. And that's why we have this little N here, indicating a complete set of chromosomes and no uh, um, not deficient in any chromosomes and not duplicated for any chromosomes. OK, so, so those were examples of non-disjunction during meiosis one and meiosis two. We saw how sometimes non-disjunction can lead to, uh, can still allow for the production of normal gametes if non-disjunction occurs during meiosis two. But if it occurs during meiosis one, it is, you know, essentially impossible to make normal gametes here. Okay, so let's go back down here. And okay, so now, you know, if you looked through the notes, you're reading the notes, uh, there's a table from an interesting study, and there's a link to uh, a review article that, that talks about this study. And there's some interesting data from humans. So from what we know so far, it appears that non-disjunction is quite common during human gametogenesis. 
Now, for example, if researchers are looking at sperm directly, the uh, karyotypes of sperm, you know, how many, uh, do, do these sperm have complete sets or are they aneuploid? Uh, researchers find about 1 to 2 percent of sperm are aneuploid. And this, what does this various over here mean? This means the aneuploidies are essentially uh, of all the possibilities. There could be uh, a, a sperm that lacks one of chromosome one, or one of chromosome two, or chromosome three, or chromosome four, all the way to uh, the sex chromosomes. Or it could have an extra chromosome. So this various here means there's, there's no bias towards any of the chromosomes with respect to aneuploidies uh, in sperm. Now this is remarkable, and I would like to see the original study here. Um, I haven't had time to look at that. But when oocytes are examined, researchers find up to 20% of them have are aneuploid. Okay, again, so various. There's no bias towards any of the chromosomes, any of the chromosomes missing or any of the chromosomes being extra with respect to the aneuploid oocytes. So 20% of them can be aneuploid. Uh, now, when we're, they're looking at pre-implantation embryos, now when we get to the part of the course where we talk about, um, uh, what are we gonna talk about? In vitro fertilization. And uh, there are techniques where researchers and clinicians and physicians are able to screen embryos for deficiencies and or aneuploidies before they're implanted. And it kind of makes sense if 20% of the oocytes are are aneuploid, that 20%, at least 20% of the pre-implantation embryos would also be aneuploid. And again, there's no bias towards any of the chromosomes being present in extra copies or being missing. Now we're going to skip this preclinical miscarriage for now. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But essentially what preclinical miscarriage is, this is, this is used to define those uh, pregnancies that occur and say the, the woman doesn't even know, doesn't even know uh, she is pregnant. And the miscarriage can occur um, without the woman ever knowing she was pregnant to begin with. So that's what that preclinical miscarriage means. Now, miscarriages. So when researchers are looking at miscarriages, they're finding up to 35% of them have uh, an aneuploidy. And the most common aneuploidies are, are, are involve an extra copy of chromosome 16, an extra copy of 21, and an extra copy of 22, or missing an X chromosome. Now, that's between six weeks and 20 weeks. So I guess after 20 weeks, maybe, uh, you know, I'm not a fertility uh, doctor or OBGYN or anything, but maybe after 20 weeks, we're going to consider that a stillbirth. Um, again, I'm not sure on the, the exact uh, terminology of, of when we call it a miscarriage and when we call it a stillbirth. But, uh, or, yeah, okay, I'm not sure on that. But, so with respect to stillbirths, 4% of those uh, are found to be uh, have aneuploidies and here we're seeing the numbers of chromosomes go down right okay so aneuploidies are are, are biased for chromosome an extra chromosome 13 or an extra 18 or an extra 21 finally when it comes to live births so when you examine all human children born about 0.3 percent of them are aneuploid and there is a bias where uh, they usually have an extra 13, an extra chromosome 18, an extra chromosome 21, or extra sex chromosomes. Now the extra sex chromosomes are, um, we're gonna talk more about this in the future. These usually are, are, are healthy, perfectly healthy. Um, extra chromosome 21, this is Down syndrome, right? So Down syndrome is usually, you know, uh, healthy. These, however, extra chromosome 13 and extra chromosome 18 are actually really uh, severe uh, phenotypes, um, syndromes, and uh, these children aren't expected to live, live that long, I think, uh, but who knows? I'm not really sure about recent advances with respect to therapies for, for individuals who are aneuploid for chromosome 13 and 
or fully aneuploid for chromosome 13 or 18. But so what I wanted to point out here is that notice how we go from no bias in the aneuploidy with respect to uh, sperm oocytes and pre-implantation embryos. So any of the human chromosomes can participate in or, or be affected by non-disjunction and end up uh, as a cause of aneuploidy in gametes. But as we get down here, we're seeing a bias towards these chromosomes here. And the idea here is that having missing any of the chromosomes, missing any copy of any other chromosome other than 13, 18, and 21, and maybe 22 and 16 for the miscarriage state here, but missing any of the, the other human chromosomes or having an extra copy of any one of these is so detrimental to the health of the embryo that those individuals are, are lost as preclinical miscarriages. So they don't develop much at all. Um, they may not even implant and they're lost. So, so, so this is an example of how important uh, it is for humans to not uh, have an extra chromosome or be missing any of the chromosomes. Um, to put another way, uh, having an extra chromosome of any of the human chromosomes other than these We'll say only these down here, 21 and, and extra sex chromosomes are, are healthy to adulthood, but having an extra of any of the chromosomes is essentially lethal. Um, and missing it, any of the chromosomes is, is thought to be uh, incompatible with human life, I should say. Of course, we have new therapies coming out with gene therapy and things like that, so who knows uh, about the future and maybe even near future. So. Okay, so that's it for the videos on this lecture. I am going to move on to, I think, typing up some of the solutions to the problems and hopefully put together some, some videos, if any, of the, for, for some of the more complicated problems. I hope to be able to do that, uh, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Okay, well, hopefully I'll see you in our next in-person lecture.